Hi, I'm Simon Gishes from Nispro Marine. Over the last 30 years, I've been involved in the high-performance automotive industry, ranging from typically, we started off in the Nissan performance game, so GDR Skylines, 300ZX, twin turbos, those types of cars, and build a business over those 30 years, basically hotting those up. Bigger turbochargers, aftermarket engine management systems, made some fairly powerful stuff. You can Google it and we, you know, we make 1200 horsepower, four litre, straight six cylinder engines that have got glowing extractors and beavering away. The old man was actually uh, a boat builder, so I did a boat building apprenticeship when I was very young, uh, but always like the engine side rather than the sticky fiberglass side. So that's how I got involved in boating and had boats with Yamahas and Mercury's and stuff on them since I was 13 or 14 years of age. You know, I look back now and go, I spent 30 years mucking around with cars and I'm right back to where I started when I was 18. A lot's changed since then, obviously. We designed the Yamaha, the first aftermarket supercharger system for Yamaha outboards that people might have seen. Back when 450 horsepower of an outboard was virtually unheard of. Those engines have come a long way. We've got a lot of them out there. We've got a whole lot of new development coming with supercharged four cylinders and even twin supercharged V8s are on the, on the to-do list. Okay, so the dyno test cell. How do we end up with a dyno test cell that is representative of what we see in real world? And that's a, that's a fair part to it. There are very few marine dynos around, unlike car stuff that, you know, 25 years ago, there was, you know, three chassis dynos in the suburb. Now, you know, you can walk up and down this industrial area here and you'll find five or six chassis dynos and worldwide, they're just obviously everywhere. Marine's a little bit different. There's just not many purpose-built marine dynos around. Right from the get-go, knowing what the experience I had with that automotive stuff was that we needed a, a you know a really killer dyno test cell. So we built we built the room we're sitting in now. This is the control room. To my left through the window is actually the the engine dyno cell. We've got 16,000 litres of of water sitting above our head that actually feeds the dyno cell. The dyno retarder is a DTS 10,000 RPM, 1,000 horsepower water brake dyno. It's mounted horizontally, which is fairly unusual and most engine dynos are vertically, so it's got its own challenges. The drive shaft comes down from the roof and effectively mounts to the top of the flywheel of the engine. So here we are inside test cell one. Uh, this is the water brake dyno that we spoke about before. Uh, this is the 10,000 RPM, 1,000 horsepower water brake retarder. It's supplied through the big black hose here from upstairs with the 16,000 litres of water. Conventional style automotive tail shaft, bolts to the flywheel through a rubber dampener. The 1200 litre tank of water that the engine sits in. So it basically takes all its water from the standard water pickups up through the engine, exhaust blows through the gearbox as it would in your boat. So it's you know got some back pressure from the, from the water it's dispersing. Internally on this end, we've got the air intake tube that goes upstairs. So we've got abundance of fresh air in the dyno cell. It's one of the things that people don't actually give a, enough notice to is that a pit, particular in this case where you can't actually put an exhaust pipe on it like on a chassis dyno, um, the exhaust fumes obviously come into the room. We do a, a you know, really good job of evacuating that. We've got two 36 inch fans on five kilowatt motors that actually vent the air out of the room. There's air vents into the cell. Um, the air's exhausted through the vents in the, in the side here. Um, that allows us to evacuate the room really well, but you'll still always get some exhaust fumes in the room. So you always want a real, really good uh, air intake to the engine from an external source. So you're getting a genuine fresh air. That's that side of it. This pipe here is the water coming back out of the dyno cell. So the water that's used to cause the, effectively the load on the engine is exhausted through here goes into another pit here, which then gets pumped back upstairs. Some of the sensors are on this. We've got a extra cam angle sensor here. This is effectively for the MoTeC, so the MoTeC knows where the engine's going. We've got a fuel flow sensor here, so we don't just rely on what the Yamaha fuel flow gauge tells us. This is actually a, a proper data instruments type fuel flow sensor, so it's very accurate. The pressure sensors are inside the cylinder. They come out and go back into the control room to the data acquisition system. Reasonable workbench if you want to pull spark plugs out and those kinds of things. You don't want to be trexing through the workshop finding tools. Fuel tank in the corner here. So this is one or two fuel tanks. This is where the engine draws the fuel from, which is just over 250 litres. 
and then we have a larger tank upstairs that feeds this one. So if we're doing some endurance testing for six or seven hours and we don't want to turn off the engine, we can actually plumb more fuel from upstairs to downstairs. People will talk about, you know, is it propeller horsepower or is it, or is it you know, flywheel horsepower? It's flywheel horsepower. But the advantage we've got is that we take a complete outboard engine and we bolt it into the tank and we're still using the lower unit, the gearbox, the whole box and dies. And so we can run it in neutral or we can run it in gear without a propeller, but it still shows us the parasitic losses within the gearbox being in gear and without. And frankly, it's two or three horsepower. You know, it, it is so small, it is just irrelevant. The other reason we like to do it that way is we get to use the factory cooling system. So we're using the standard pickup on the lower unit, the standard water pump. So all that remains exactly the same as what you see when you're, in, you're driving a your boat. The other part about that, I've seen other dynos and there's very few, like I said, but they take the power head off the engine and they, they mount the power head onto the dyno. The problem with that is we're now not using the factory exhaust system. Everyone who's mucked around with cars knows they change the exhaust system, diameter extractors and so forth, and that makes an effect. And so we wanted to reproduce exactly what the outboard was doing in the water to here. Yamaha, typically like most outboard manufacturers, they use the air being ingested by the engine to actually keep some airflow through the cowl and keep the under bonnet temperature, so to speak, cooler. So their air temperatures are actually usually quite high. They can be sort of, you know, in a climate of, at 20, 22 degrees C, they can be at sort of 46. They're, you know, quite often 25 degrees above ambient temperature. There's an example of that where we set up three supercharged V6s that we did in the Middle East. And, you know, it's 50 degree day. And, you know, the standard air temperatures of those engines are somewhere in the order of, you know, 90 degrees C air intake temperature. The advantage with our supercharger system is that we're using the intercooler to cool the charge temperature and the, the water is actually cooling the intercoolers. And we see about six degrees above ambient water temperature. So the water temperature over there is about 32. We've got 38 degrees of air intake temperature where the naturally aspirated engine is running, you know, mid nineties. So it's interesting. And if you have a look at the power loss at 90 degrees C, on a 425 horsepower V8 Yamaha, you've lost 40, 50 horsepower. The supercharged engine performed as per it should, and we rate them to 450, and the naturally aspirated engine has lost 50 horsepower of, its, of the sticker hanging on the side of the engine. But we need to be able to reproduce that when we get it here. And so all of those factors are, are vitally important. You know, People don't understand how important it is to have a test cell that is repeatable. If you haven't got repeatable figures, you can make a change with mixture and timing and camshaft. And if you can't repeat it, forget what the number is, forget if it's 200 or 400, you want to be able to repeat the number accurately, pass after pass after pass. And a typical calibration like this, we may do four to 500 dyno sweeps. One of the ways we obtain our power figure to make it very accurate is we do what we call a ramp up and ramp down. So what that entails is that we will start the, the dyno ramp test at 1500 RPM. We'll run it to our maximum engine speed. In the F200, for example, that's 6300 RPM. When the dyno gets to 6300 RPM, it actually then pulls the engine down from 63 back to 1500, like it's going up a massive hill, which you can never do in your boat. However, what it, it does two things. It tells us that even under those ridiculously extreme conditions, the engine is tuned correctly. But when you have a look at the dynamics of how you're measuring power, on the sweep up, the engine is taking some of its brake horsepower to accelerate the flywheel, the crankshaft, and all the reciprocating mass of the engine. That is power that you can't measure. It's lost power. On the way back down, it's the opposite. The inertia of the flywheel and the crankshaft is now adding to the power number. So why do we go up and down? We go up and down, and then the dyno software divides the number by two. So now we get an absolute number not inflicted by parasitic losses of, of mass. So it's the number you'd actually get if you hold it at 4,000 RPM and don't vary the speed. It's the same number. We go a step further than that. We actually run three dyno pulls in a row. So we do that same test three times. We completely ignore the first test because the first test is always high because the combustion chamber, water temperature, all those things are low. The second one is usually the best. The third one is usually a little bit less because the engine's heated up. We grab those two last tests, we add them together and we divide them by two. So we do three tests, ignore the first, 
and average the second two. That way we get unbelievably good repeatability. And if you have a look at some of the, the dyno logs and they're, they're color co coordinated, so depending on which one you've done, we've got six different colors. You can't tell which color it is. They overlay so closely to each other. So you put an extra degree of timing in it. If it makes a difference, we see it. And that's how we get the tunes and the calibration so accurate. It's very easy to get tied up in numbers. They're all really the reasons that you know we do that, the accuracy that we go to, and without having that equipment, you just can't get it right.